There are stories, tucked away in the grim annals of history and medicine, that defy easy explanation. They are tales of prisoners of war, found lying still in their bunks, not starved, not beaten, but simply gone. Their eyes are open, yet vacant, as if the very spark of life has been extinguished by an unseen hand. They are stories of shipwrecked survivors who, after days of fighting against the odds, suddenly fall silent, turn their faces to the sky, and pass away, despite having the physical strength to continue. How can a person, whose body is still a viable, functioning machine, simply decide to die? Is the will to live merely a poetic phrase we use to describe resilience? Or is it a tangible, biological switch that, when flipped, can plunge a human being into a final, irreversible darkness? This phenomenon, long relegated to the realm of folklore, or dismissed as a symptom of something else, has a name, psychogenic death. It is not suicide, an active choice to end one's life. It is not, in its purest form, clinical depression. It is a far stranger and more terrifying process, a complete and passive surrender, a quiet withdrawal from the world that culminates in a rapid physiological shutdown. For decades, it was a medical mystery. But thanks to the work of researchers like Dr. John Leach, a survival psychologist from the United Kingdom, we are beginning to understand the chillingly precise mechanism behind what he termed give up, itis. It is the discovery of the human off switch and the revelation that the belief in hopelessness can be as lethal as any poison. The journey to understanding this fatal surrender begins not in a modern laboratory, but in the anthropological field notes of the 1940s. Harvard physiologist Walter Cannon was captivated by accounts of voodoo death, where individuals in certain cultures, believing they had been cursed by a shaman, would inexplicably sicken and die within days. Cannon dismissed supernatural explanations, proposing instead a purely physiological one. He theorized that the victim's absolute belief in their impending doom triggered a state of perpetual, unrelenting fear. This intense stress, he argued, sent their sympathetic nervous system, the body's fight-or-flight command, center into such a state of overdrive that it eventually led to a catastrophic collapse of blood pressure and circulatory failure. The mind, gripped by terror, was literally running the body into the ground. While Cannon's work was groundbreaking, the concept remained on the fringes of Western medicine. That is, until similar patterns began to emerge from the most brutal environments of the 20th century, prisoner of war camps. During the Korean War, military physicians documented a bewildering condition they called lethal apathy. Young, physically healthy soldiers would suddenly retreat into themselves. They would stop communicating, refuse food, and neglect all personal hygiene, often lying in their own filth. They showed no overt signs of mental illness or suicidal intent. Rather, they displayed a profound and eerie indifference to their own survival. Doctors who observed it noted that this state was not a slow decline, but a rapid slide. Within a matter of days, a once vital soldier would be dead. They hadn't been killed by a specific disease or by their captors. They had simply given up. This was not a choice made in a moment of despair. It was the end point of a process, a quiet and final capitulation of the will. It was these harrowing accounts that formed the basis of Dr. John Leach's research. By meticulously analyzing case studies from POWs, shipwreck survivors, and even plane crash victims, Leach identified a predictable, sequential pattern leading to death. He dissected the process of giving up, transforming it from a vague notion of despair into a clinical progression with five distinct stages. The first stage is social withdrawal. Following a traumatic event, the individual begins to pull away from the world. This is not just quietness, it's a profound emotional retreat. They become passive, listless, and seemingly devoid of feeling. They cease to engage in social interaction, isolating themselves as a protective measure against further psychological pain. This is a common coping mechanism, but in cases of give up itis, it becomes the first step down a perilous slope. Next comes apathy, a deeper and more dangerous state of indifference. The will to help oneself vanishes, the basic instincts for survival cleanliness, grooming, seeking food dissolve. Leach noted that individuals in this stage would often become incontinent and lie in their own waste without any apparent shame or concern. He called this state symbolic filth, 
Viewing it as an outward manifestation of the internal belief that they were worthless and already dead, they have lost the inner drive to fight for their own dignity. The third stage is abulia, a term from neuropsychology that signifies a severe paralysis of the will. The person is still conscious and aware of their surroundings, but they are utterly incapable of initiating purposeful action. They might know they need to get up, to eat, to move, but the connection between thought and action is severed. It's as if the mind's ignition key has been lost. They lie there, often with eyes open, trapped inside a body they can no longer command, a prisoner in their own silent mind. From abulia, the victim descends into the fourth stage, psychic akinesia. Here, consciousness itself begins to fade. The individual is now largely oblivious to their environment and, crucially, no longer responds to extreme stimuli, including pain. A person in this state might not flinch if struck or show any reaction to a loud noise. They have withdrawn so completely that even the most primal reflex to pain is extinguished. They have truly and finally let go. The fifth and final stage is psychogenic death. This is the physiological endgame. Leach posits that after a prolonged period of the body being primed for a fight-or-flight response that never resolves, the system finally crashes. The overactive sympathetic nervous system gives way to an unopposed, catastrophic surge from the parasympathetic system, which governs rest. This leads to a sudden, dramatic drop in blood pressure and a slowing of the heart rate until it simply stops. The body, following the mind's lead, switches itself off. What Leach observed behaviorally, modern neuroscience can now begin to explain biochemically. The key to understanding give up itis lies deep within the brain's frontal lobes, in a region called the prefrontal cortex. This is the seat of our executive functions, planning, decision making, and personality. And within this area lies a critical structure known as the anterior cingulate cortex, or ACC. Think of the ACC as the neurological engine of our will. It is the part of the brain that fires up when we initiate a goal-directed behavior, whether it's getting out of bed in the morning or running a marathon. It provides the spark that turns intention into action. According to the scientific model of psychogenic death, the process begins when the brain concludes that a situation is both inescapable and hopeless. When an individual internalizes the belief that they have lost all control, that nothing they do will ever matter again, the activity in the anterior cingulate cortex grinds to a halt, it essentially goes offline. This neurological shutdown triggers a catastrophic chemical cascade. The most important effect is the cessation of dopamine production and transmission related to that circuit. Dopamine is the brain's primary chemical messenger for motivation, reward, and pleasure. It is the go-get-it neurochemical that drives us to seek rewards and engage with the world. Without a functioning ACC to signal for it, the dopamine supply line is cut. The result is a direct and devastating manifestation of the symptoms Leach described. The loss of motivation and pleasure is apathy. The inability to initiate action is abulia. The brain, deprived of its motivational fuel, can no longer command the body to perform the basic tasks of survival. It is a state of profound and systemic shutdown, originating in the highest centers of thought and cascading down to the most basic functions of life. This mental collapse is what allows the autonomic nervous system, the background system that regulates heart rate and blood pressure, to fall into the fatal dysregulation that marks the final stage of death. The mind, by giving up, has severed its own command over the body. Of course, if a switch can be turned off, the most vital question is, can it be turned back on? The answer, fortunately, is yes. The antidote to the fatal slide of give up itis is as simple in concept as it is powerful in practice, restoring a sense of agency. Agency is the belief that you have control over your own actions and their consequences. It is the opposite of helplessness. Leach and other survival psychologists emphasize that reversing the process, especially in the early stages of social withdrawal and apathy, is achievable. The key is to re-engage the anterior cingulate cortex. This doesn't require a grand, life-altering event. It can be sparked by the smallest assertion of control. For a prisoner, it might be the simple act of cleaning their tiny corner of a cell. For a shipwreck survivor, it could be fashioning a tool or mending a piece of cloth. Crucially, one of the most powerful ways to restore agency is to take an action that helps someone else. These small, purposeful tasks reboot the dormant circuits. They send a signal to the brain that says, 
My actions still matter. That signal is enough to restart the flow of dopamine, rebuilding motivation from the ground up, and pulling the individual back from the brink. This scientific finding gives a concrete neurological basis to the profound wisdom of psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl. In his seminal book, Man's Search for Meaning, Frankl observed that the prisoners in concentration camps who were most likely to survive were not necessarily the strongest physically, but those who managed to find a purposa reason to live beyond their suffering. Whether it was the hope of reuniting with a loved one, a scientific work to complete, or a spiritual faith to uphold, this sense of future purpose was the anchor that held them to life. They maintained their agency by choosing their attitude, even when all other choices were stripped away. Conclusion Give up, itis, or psychogenic death, is not a myth, nor is it a sign of moral or spiritual weakness. It is a tangible, observable neurophysiological event. It is the final, tragic outcome of a brain that has been convinced of its own powerlessness, leading to the shutdown of the very neurological systems that generate our will to live. The discovery of this human off switch reveals a fundamental truth about our existence. The connection between mind and body is absolute and unbreakable. Hope, purpose, and will are not just poetic ideals. They are biological imperatives, as critical to our survival as oxygen and water. Understanding this mechanism does more than just explain historical tragedies. It hands us a powerful tool for the present. It informs how we care for the elderly in nursing homes, how we treat patients facing grim diagnoses, and how we must approach our own moments of crisis. It teaches us that fostering a sense of purpose, nurturing control over our environment, and maintaining social bonds are not luxuries, but essential acts of self-preservation. In a world that can often feel overwhelming, the knowledge that we can actively protect and reboot our own will to live is perhaps the most profound survival skill of all.